really grateful that uh, you all have come out on a hot day. Um, that way? Or, <laughs> okay. Of, of course, most people in uh, southern Arizona are just celebrating seeing rain. So uh, uh, we didn't expect a big turnout. Uh, down where I live, we saw a bunch of people just out in the streets naked uh, using soap for the first time in months. <laughs> But uh, it was really uh, wonderful to get the rains that we have. And we're grateful that uh, we've attracted um, one of um, uh, Mexico's um, most innovative mesquite scholars, uh, Gerardo Ruiz Smith, uh, from where he lives in Guadalajara, in uh, the Altiplano of central Mexico, to come up and tell about a range of projects that uh, he's been involved in with Mesquite. And uh, since he's still right out of the room, I can, I can brag a little bit about him. Um, in addition to um, um, being involved as a permaculture uh, trainer and practitioner, he's been involved in restoration projects and um, uh, perennial polyculture um, uh, projects for food security in a number of states in Mexico. He actually grew up in uh, Sonora in part in Agua Prieta, uh, Santana area, uh, Ciudad Obregón, and other parts of Sonora. So he knows the Sonoran Desert very well. But in addition, he's worked in the incredible arid landscape of the Valle de Tehuacan in Puebla and Oaxaca. Uh, with uh, Weechul um, and their um, involvement in the Altiplano and desert from um, the Sierra Madre Occidental out into the uh, deserts of San Luis Potosi. And he's also been involved in uh, some restoration of ranches in both Northern Jalisco and in Baja California Sur in the Cape region. So he's not restricted to deserts, but some of his best work has been in deserts. In addition, uh, Gerardo and his mother have a mesquite um, micro enterprise that you'll hear about. And they've been really of great help guiding both the uh, um, Concoc or Seri people in Sonora with fine tuning their mesquite business, something that Brad Lancaster has also uh, helped us with over the years. And people in Patagonia, um, with what Borderlands Restoration is doing with the Mesquite Microenterprise and a community Mesquite uh, co-op. So we're really lucky to have Gerardo um, both have experience in this region and do incredible innovations in other regions as well. He's a graduate of Monterrey Tech, which as many of you know, is one of the largest online universities in the world, uh, but he uh, did, um, on groundwork at three of their campuses and um, now uses this as uh, partial, uh, it's only one of his many involvements, but the 200 acre Via Organica farm that's associated with Regeneration International uh, outside of San Miguel Allende is where I met him after reading his articles for years. And so I welcome Gerardo and I'm sure we'll have enough time for questions and great to have you with us. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, thanks everybody for coming. I, I must say that I'm a little overwhelmed of all the amazing things that I've seen in the last 24 hours since I arrived to Arizona. Uh, very blessed for the last night rains. Uh, it was a beautiful welcoming to, to these lands. Uh, so yeah, very happy to be here and share some of the work and the experiences that we have in Mexico with, with mesquite and regenerative agriculture in general. I work as a farm consultant designer with mostly private clients, but also a few uh, projects with indigenous communities. Uh, as Gary said, my main uh, line of work is how can we restore drylands in a way that's actually profitable in, commercially viable. 
so that more farmers and ranchers are actually interested in, in applying and implementing these models, not just for conservation purposes, but that they actually benefit their their economies and their incomes and and they provide a very like um, a good livelihood for them and to their children and future generations. So yeah, thank you for having me. This is an amazing, amazing building. I've never been to a campus that has uh, San Pedro cactus growing on the on the gardens. It's very original. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll be talking about the many of the things that are very well known here in Tucson about mesquite and the importance of these three species in the desert ecosystem. So I won't take too much time going over that. Um, I must say that I'm super inspired and I've been very inspired by the work being done here in Tucson for many years. Uh, I used to live in Magdalena and Obregón in Sonora for, for many years, so super wonderful to be back. I wasn't, I, it's been like 14 years since I was in Sonora and Arizona, so super excited to be back. Thank you guys. So, uh, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, so we're just gonna start going in a overall about the context we're, we're working on and and how the future looks like for drylands in, in this part of the world with all the climate change projection on, on the decrease of agricultural productivity between now and 2080. 2080. So Mexico and this part of the US is, um, in this study they projected a decrease of 25% in agricultural productivity for the last, for the next 60 years and the population trends are like totally opposite. So that puts the whole region in a very delicate place. Of course, um, that agricultural practices like over pumping uh, aquifers for annual irrigation, heavy on chemicals. This is in Guanajuato near my house. Uh, and this is all broccoli being exported to the US using like fossil water from every, everything from 600 to 900 feet uh, deep. And this is the, um, a graph of the levels of the aquifer in the last, since the 1950s, where the groundwater was uh, anything from uh, 15 feet down below. And right now some wells are going all the way to 1500 feet in just about 60, 70 years. 85% uh, of that water is being used for agriculture. And now, since these are super ancient aquifers, the water is coming up with super high levels of uh, arsenic and fluoride, which is uh, being consumed, uh, drink by many of the rural communities in the area. And it's also um, accumulating on the agricultural soils itself, which we don't even know which, uh, how, how is that going to impact the, the actual products that are being grown in those soils. So many abandoned farm farms in the area as well, because they are, it's just not profitable enough to be pumping waters from such a uh, deep wells and the organic matter content and the fertility is basically all gone. So they're just abandoning all these farmlands. And uh, well, this whole area used to be uh, mesquite savannas as well. It's, it's part of the, like the lowest part of the Chihuahuan desert. And here's where, where our ally comes into play. Uh, well, if you live in Tucson, you obviously know a lot about mesquite. You see it every day. Uh, the, this species is Prosopis lavigata. It's the one that grows throughout the uh, lowest part of the Chihuahuan Desert, all the way to southern Mexico, uh, the Oaxacan, Oaxaca coast, and Puebla, and Querétaro. Uh, very interesting species. It has a lot of uh, potential for, for its edible potential, because um, pretty much any, there's very little diversity in, on the pot flavor. They're all pretty sweet. 
very low in tannin, so that's super uh, great about this species. Um, obviously, it's uh, an amazing source of uh, food for many pollinators in the area, native and non-native. Uh, the pods, here's a little, um, this is from Felker, little collection of different pods from different prosopis species from throughout the Americas. So prosopis can grow any, anywhere from here, southern US to Patagonia, Chile, uh, Peru, Central America, and 60% of Mexico actually. So more than half of the Mexico territory is pretty much covered in mesquite. And it can also grow in some of the driest places in the world, like this one in the Atacama Desert, Prosopis tamarugo, or uh, these ones that I found pretty much growing next to the ocean, both in Hawaii and Oaxaca, uh, pretty much with the roots soaked in salt water, which is super interesting. And I tried both, both of the pots and they were super sweet, which is like something really, really special. I worked in Northern Jalisco um, with a mine remediation project. And we found this mesquite growing on the tailing site where, where all the nasty chemicals from mining was being dumped. And I even saw it flowering and producing pots inside the like 40, 50 feet of uh, toxic sands from mining. Here's another one that I found, same, same place. These were actually inundated by the, all the wastewater from the mining. And they will spend like two or three months per year with the roots underwater and still survive somehow. So it's pretty incredible, resilient, adaptable. This is funny, this is in San Miguel de Allende. They even, it's very similar to what's going on here with the beautiful basins. <laughs> it is all paved all the way to the trunk and, and or coming out of a building through the walls and still like making pots and, and flowering every year. So it's incredible. So we'll talk a little bit about, about the mesquite ecology and, and the, the importance of uh, these species in the deserts, both as a nurse plant, uh, taking care of many of the younger or, or more tender species like agaves, nopales, opuntias, uh, sages, uh, chile, chiltepin in Sonora, in Arizona, and um, also like helping to cool down the, the temperature of the deserts, uh, providing shade for many and habitat for many uh, animals and insects, birds. Mm, this is what many of the region used to look like, like this mes beautiful open mesquite savannas where not long ago, maybe 10 to 12,000 years ago, we had all this amazing megafauna roaming and grazing throughout these savannas. This is all the megafauna that was found in Mexico uh, 10 or 12,000 years ago. So it looked a little bit like a Serengeti but with mesquite and mammoths and three meter high slot, slots, the bisons, the, all this amazing fauna. We don't have any of this, but we still have cattle, goats, sheep. We are, they are sort of playing the same role when they are not being managed in a way that they overgraze the land. But they're also like the main um, distributors of the mesquite itself, no? Like this is a cow uh, dung with probably 20 or 30 mesquite seedlings growing throughout uh, after the seeds are being scarified by the, acid, the acids of the stomach. And you can even see a little mushroom. So it's already inoculated with uh, mycorrhizae and other fungi. I talked about the pollinators. Mexico's main source of uh, honey exports are from the mesquite flower, the mesquite nectar. And it's funny, I was in Hawaii a couple of years ago where they do the kiabe honey, which is supposed to be the most expensive uh, honey in the world. And it's all being produced by these invasive 
a species of Prosopis pallida that was brought, I think, by a Spanish priest from Peru to the Kiev Botanical Garden in Europe and then brought to Hawaii, to one of the islands, and they just thrive and covered all the, how every Iceland has like a dry land, a dry side and a very wet side. And all the dry sides are pretty much covered in mesquite. And so many, many people are having an amazing war against the mesquite for, for being an invasive, but many other people um, are actually using it to make mesquite uh, flour and mesquite honey, the cave honey, which I think is now the main agricultural export of Hawaii as well. So yeah, we, we're going to talk now about the, what's the harvesting and the processing that we do. Um, and see, like right now, what I'm going to show is like a small scale, more artisanal production systems. But uh, part of the intention of my work is how can we actually scale what I'm going to show you uh, to more, either like a decentralized network of small producers, which I'm already trying to start in Mexico, working with different indigenous communities. So that like the Comcac people that we just came from in Sonora. I'm also working in a, another project in Tehuacan with uh, German funds and another pro project in the Wirikuta region of San Luis Potosí, the sacred desert of the Huichol people, and the project that we have right now in San Miguel in Guanajuato. So basically, we want to come up with a network of uh, small mesquite enterprises that are helping to restore the ecosystems and providing livelihoods for these communities, but also trying to promote mesquite as an, actually, an actual agricultural crop that can be uh, use strategically to, to bring back productivity to the, all these abandoned farm fields that are spread throughout Mexico's drylands and uh, obviously integrated with other um, crops in, in diversified agroforestry systems. But this is going to be just like an introduction to the small scale uh, and the historic process, harvesting and processing. So here's a Comcac uh, woman. Uh, harvesting the the mesquite pots, um, they are one probably the last uh, indigenous culture in Mexico that still keeps the tradition of harvesting every year and processing it and eating it, and they really never lost it, uh, which is a great great treasure for me. I was just there with Gary and it was amazing to talk with one of the el elders, a woman uh, who was just explaining me the whole process of how they used to do it when they were totally nomads and how they were doing the harvesting, how they were doing the the roasting of the pots in the hot uh, sand that they put a few fires around them and just mixing the pots with the hot sand to get it very dry and brittle and then using these rock mortars uh, with, a, with a big mesquite pole to actually grind it. And then that flour, they will make it into a little like cake, hard cake that they could store in these um, terracotta jars inside underground for a few months or up to a year sometimes. So now what they're like, they, they gather the, the, the pots. Here's a, a, a Comcac woman doing a, a hand um, grinding of the mesquite pots, some of the mortars that I found in the museum of the Desert Museum of uh, Coahuila in Saltillo that were also used for mesquite. And these ones that I found in Baja California Norte as well, in the Mesquite Bridge. In San Miguel, uh, we've been bringing a few groups of students from uh, middle school and high schools in the region, rural schools that come and help us with the with the harvesting, and this is one of the groups that we had, and that was the harvest that we all uh, gathered in, in a few hours in, in a beautiful ranch outside San Miguel de Allende. Once we gather the, the pots, uh, they go through a selection process where we just make sure that only the best quality pots are being um, used for the, for the milling to make the flour. 
So we have about, in San Miguel, we have about, it's a big family, about six, seven women and all their grand children and grandchildren who go out to harvest from their, like wild harvest the mesquite from their fields. And, and they've been working with us or we've been working with them for the last five years now. And then, then the selection process, we do sun drying in um, this metal sheet for maybe a day or two under the super strong sun. We'll cover it during the night. And then we do the roasting, the slight roasting with a, with a toaster just to make sure that it's super dry and brittle. Um, I just saw the one there, uh, Gary and Lori took to Desemboque, which is a chili roaster that they modify with a, a tighter mesh inside and a propane burner. I think I got uh, probably Gary's best shot here. Yeah. Roasting uh, mesquite beans. We, we show the, the Comcac woman how to make the, the mesquite coffee or coffee substitute, just roasting the dry or, or using the, the toaster for much longer than what they used for the flour, just to get it like roasted and then we grind it up and, and prepare the mesquite coffee for them and they really, really loved it. Uh, which is really cool because they don't actually need to use the, the mill to, to make the mesquite coffee. I brought, I think I brought a jar here, so we, we didn't have enough for all of you, but uh, you can smell it, it smells really good. I'll leave it on the table. Then um, I was in, in Peru visiting some mesquite processing projects sponsored by the government. This was installed many, many years ago, like a, two decades ago. And it's, um, it's also a hand powered rota rotational uh, toaster. But this is a, this uses wood, firewood instead of gas. And it has this system of uh, wheels so that it's easier to actually do the turning. And this is the one that I just designed and built in San Miguel de Allende. It's a stainless steel, it's about 80 gallon capacity. And it has a electric engine with a reduction system. So it just goes like very, it's like about two revolutions per, no, four seconds per revolution. It also has a propane, two propane burners inside. So we use this to, after the sun drying, just to make sure that it's super brittle and dry before the grinding for the flour. But we also use it for the mesquite uh, roasted coffee. This was like three days ago, we were grinding um, mesquite with the Comcac woman. Here's Gary again helping. Uh, we went over their process and just helped them with a few ideas on how to improve the, the work they're doing already. And it was both a mesquite and a permaculture training for about two, two days. Amazing, amazing experience. Uh, so they have a metal mill, hammer mill, like the ones you use here in Tucson that I think uh, Gary and Lori took down many years ago, still functioning well. This is the one that I use in San Miguel de Allende, in Guanajuato, for the milling. It's a Mexican brand, um, Molinos Azteca. It's also run by a, by a small Honda engine, and it comes with the little trailer already included for about $2,000 or something. And the next, the one on the right is the one being used in Peru. It's all stainless steel. So very similar technology, but um, it's foot grade stainless steel, which is what we're, the same company that builds these ones, um, they can also make it in stainless steel. So that's what we're trying to find and get one of them uh, so that we can have a, one line of our production can be actually certified by the Mexican um, laws and then potentially export it into the US so that you don't have to be bringing mesquite all the way from Peru and Argentina. It can be bring, coming from either the Comca community or the San Luis Potosí, Wiricuta region or Guanajuato. 
uh, on a larger quantity and volume. So here's the mesquite grinding, the milling, the, um, the flour. This was the first uh, packages that we did. And it was pretty sure it was the first uh, like actual package mesquite uh, from Mexico being sold in Mexico, sold in Mexico. Uh, and this is the new packaging that we'll be having. Uh, the idea here is to actually be able to buy mesquite from like from the Comca community and these other projects that I mentioned you. And then can we could probably highlight each of the communities that are producing the, the mesquite flower with all the information about their culture, the region, what practice are they doing. Uh, and it'll be like coffee, you know, where you can buy coffee from different, like from Salvador, Mexico, Ethiopia, or Costa Rica. So maybe we can have something similar with mesquite. Uh, another interesting process is also, I also saw this in Peru. Uh, and this is for the, to make the mesquite syrup, concentrated syrup. So they will basically boil the, the pots for about an hour and a half in these stainless steel big pots. And about an hour and a half, they take them they take the pots out of the the, the stainless steel uh, pot, and they have this uh, like a press. It's also a so they put the pots inside this mesh. They let it um, all the liquids fall back into the the container, and then they put the pots inside the um, press just to take all the juices, and that goes back into the boiling for another half hour and a half. And they're just like moving it constantly so that it doesn't burn. And then you come up, they come up with this thick syrup that they also sell throughout Peru. And they use it a lot for cocktails, the bartenders for the Pisco cocktails with Algarro. And this was actually like a more formal um, production system in Peru as well. Everything is stainless steel and they were exporting it to, to other countries in South America. They were also, you could also buy the mesquite uh, cafe de Algarroba, the mesquite coffee, roasted coffee in supermarkets and different stores. E, um, I mean, these are some of the brands that are being sold here in the US. They're all produced either in Peru and Argentina. The reason why I started all of this, uh, well, there's two parts of it. One is that I lived in Sonora, as I told you, in Baja California for about 15 years. So I was always surrounded by mesquite. And many years after that, I was living in, in the Bay Area in San Francisco. I took a permaculture course. And one of my teachers was saying, uh, oh, wow, like you're from Mexico. No, you're so lucky to have the mesquite, such an amazing food. And I was like, what are you talking about? No, like, <laughs> it's not possible. Like if I spend 15 years of my life in Mexico, of course I will know if it was edible, no? Otherwise, like, it just doesn't make any sense. But then I went back home and just started researching and saw all this talk, literature that's out there. That's how I first started uh, reading about Gary's work as well. He, I was just mind blown that um, I spent so many years surrounded by mesquite and nobody ever told me that it was edible or that it has been eaten for hundreds or thousands of years before that. So it just made like a, just became a little obsession of mine. And then I went to a fancy organic food store in Mexico City. And so, so, so I saw one of these brands. So it was a uh, mesquite from Peru packaged and labeled in the US, brought back to Mexico. No? And it just, it, just, it just so ridiculous that I said, no, we, we have to do something about it right now. And that's how the whole project started. Now um, I'm working mostly with my my mother. She's taking care of the of the business while I do all the consultancy. And we're also running a mesquite nursery that I'll show you a few pictures about. So uh, then, how, how what about eating mesquite? No, like taking the title of the amazing book that you guys come up with here in Tucson. Um, 
one of the first things that I did was to fly down to uh, Cordoba, Argentina. I had some friends there and I knew it was a region where the mesquite algarrobo was being pro processed. And it was very interesting to find all these different, like the alfajores, cookies, the bread, and the roasted mesquite coffees in different supermarkets and stores, like a regular product. Uh, we started doing the waffles as well. Uh, this is a algarrobina cocktail with pisco in Peru that you can get at any any bar or or restaurant. This is also a, a mesquite um, liquor, mesquite uh, ice cream with the syrup made with the syrup. The this amazing uh, ice cream that we make with. Uh, frozen banana, mesquite dates, and other amazing ingredients. I heard there's really good mesquite waffles here in Tucson. So maybe you'll have to come down and see if we can do a comparison or a, a mesquite, con a mesquite uh, waffle contest. Uh, I'm always recognizing and promoting the work of uh, desert harvesters and what they did with these two amazing recipe books, they eat mesquite and now they eat mesquite and more. Uh, I was, as I mentioned before, super inspired from the very beginning by the amazing work they've been doing for so many years. Uh, so yeah, lots of amazing recipes that we have tried there and also work with some people in Mexico to come up with more. Uh, we did, we tested our mesquite flour for, for the nutritional contents, uh, aflatoxins, uh, gluten-free, so it's gluten-free certified. Uh, we got the super small uh, content of aflatoxins of only two parts per billion. I think the limit in the U.S. is 10 and in Mexico is about 20. Um, it has about 12% protein. And yeah, as I mentioned, gluten-free certified, high energy content, high protein content, has eight essential amino acids, high dietary fiber, low glycemic index, and high mineral density of really important uh, elements like zinc, magnesium, potassium, and iron. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the propagation. Uh, we've been selecting like the best quality, best tasting pots from the San Miguel de Allende region. Uh, not only for the flavor and the thickness of the pots, but also for other things like uh, we found a few trees that are thornless, spineless, for some weird genetic mutation, uh, because pretty much all trees have uh, spines in, in, the, in the area. So we've been also selecting from those thornless ones, uh, the ones with the best tasting pots, and those are the ones we've been uh, propagating mostly by seeds some of the selection we've been doing. Uh, we extract the seeds, we set up a little nursery uh, with a campesino family that, I'm, that are my partners in this venture. And we are using these like deep uh, forestry tubes for um, air pruning. So they're raised from the ground and every time the root goes through this mesh at the bottom, the tap root and the other roots get uh, pruned by the oxygen, the contact with the oxygen. And they have these ribs inside the tube so that roots don't go around. They all go down, straight down. And this is what the root system looks like on the small seedlings that I took from the tubes. So the tap root is super straight and healthy. And um, we grow about between two and 2,000 and 2,500 mesquite seedlings from these selected trees every year. Uh, it's Doña, Doña Beli, Doña Rosa, my partners. E, these trees go mostly to the ranches and farmers that I'm working with on the actual design and implementation of agroforestry and silvopastoral systems. No, we we have other interesting species like different opuntias for nopal for for the prickly pear for the for the tuna, different species of agaves, other edible cactus, um, pine nuts, a few edible acorn oaks, and the intention of this project is just to propagate um, agroforestry 
drought tolerant crops that have a commercial potential in the area. Also, we brought a few students from, they're studying forestry engineering, so they come and, and, and do some practices at the nursery. And from here, I take these uh, trees to the projects that I just mentioned. And these are about a year and a half old. E now, throughout with the work with Be Organica that Gary mentioned as well, we're working a lot with air layering, uh, making cuttings through air layering technique from selected mesquite trees as well that have like good potential for pot production. So basically, we just take a cut a ring through the bark and tie these plastic bags, spread a little of hormone root hormone powder around the, the clear bark, and uh, we fill the bags with uh, moist coconut core, close the bag, and then in about three months, sometimes we go back with, a, or they go back with a syringe just to rehydrate the whole um, media, that's the coconut core. In about three months, we start uh, getting the, the whole bag full of uh, roots. Here's a tree where we're also doing the pruning of the tree. So taking all the lower branches to do their layering clones and help the tree to actually have a better shape. And each, each one of these is gonna be a, a pretty good sized tree that's already flowering and, and, and producing fruits so we can just cut the time that it takes for 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 them to start bearing the the pots as well and avoid many of the issues we had with with the smaller trees with rabbits and and other animals eating it so we don't have to protect it, each little tree some of the work being done in in argentina with um grafting as well grafting seedlings with the selected uh, cultivars and and chosen genetics, very interesting. And then, uh, so I'm just going to move to the to the vision for a mesquite agriculture that uh, that I've been trying to promote in in, in Mexico. Uh, a lot of this work has been done through the through the Bio Organica Ranch. Uh, they've been great supporters of these initiatives, both with mesquite and now with agave as well. This is their demonstration center. It's a training and demonstration center in, located outside of San Miguel Allende. It can uh, house about 40 students, participants, with, has a restaurant, has the, the vegetable gardens, uh, fruit trees, chickens for egg production. Uh, we have a herd of goats and sheep being grazed with electric fencing, uh, very interesting. A very interesting fact is that um, it's the only ranch that I know in the region that it works 100% with rainwater, has no well. So it's year round rain, uh, rainwater. Every structure has uh, gutters and it's connected to a underground cistern that's also used as a foundation for the, for the buildings. And four years ago, I helped them design and build this um, earth, um, earth dams for water catchment with some um, water conservation channels to harvest all the runoff from this hill uh, directed to this pond. Once this is full, the overflow goes to the big one. And that was the first year when we built, in, built them. And that was the first year in about, in the whole history of the ranch that they didn't have to buy uh, pipe trucks for water during the drought, during the dry season. Um, this is also in the Bio Organica Ranch, another area of the of the ranch that I also helped design, and we did this uh, this uh, render that I made. We did those terraces with mesquite and agave, and nopuntia nopal for having alleys in between for grazing the sheep and the goat herd with the electric net. And last year we also worked on this project inside the ranch. So this is a thirty acre. Mesquite Agave Agroforestry System, 
Uh, we planted about uh, 30,000 agaves and in a very high density system interplanted with uh, mesquite. So the, there's two yellow, uh, green lines that are agave, then the red one are mesquite, and it's all um, perennial native grasses in the understory. And this area over here is uh, an alley cropping system following a key line pattern for water uh, retention to grow uh, corn, the milpa, in between the, the rows of uh, perennials. This is another system inside the ranch as well. This is a, a pomegranate and mesquite and agave agroforestry system. So we have two rows of agave and then uh, a row of mesquite and pomegranate, so one and one, and then the agave the trees, the agaves, the trees, and this is all a perennial grass that was grazed with the, with the goats and the sheep. This is another proposal that we did for tuna for prickled pear production. Um, this is the render of the alley cropping system that I just mentioned with corn. Another image of the same render. Uh, just a render on the on the feature that we trying to manifest at the ranch. This is another design that I did recently for um, this project that I'm working on in, in the Tehuacan Biosphere Reserve in Puebla for mezcal producers as well. So instead of just having like large scale agave monocultures, we are gonna do a model for, to, uh, for this like alley cropping of agaves for mezcal with mesquite, uh, waje, leucaena, another nitrogen, fast growing nitrogen fixer, and the pitaya that they grow there as well as stenocerus. Um, also like following a key line pattern for water retention and, and distribution. This is a render of the same system. This one is repeating. Um, there's a really interesting ex experiment from the University of uh, Guanajuato, not far from where I live. This is uh, this was done by my colleague and friend, Dr. Juan Frias, uh, and he planted this mesquite orchard about 12 years ago, all from seedlings, and they're a space like 15 feet apart. And uh, they've been measuring the, the potential for firewood production when they do um, the pruning. And they were also doing at some point the measurements on the mesquite production, the, the production of pots per hectare as well. And next to it, it they have this other, uh, a second mesquite orchard. This is only about eight years old, but the difference is that this one was all planted through air layering cuttings. And it hasn't been watered um, since, since the planting which was one of my concerns with the, with the cuttings, their layering cuttings, because um, I was wondering if the seedlings or the, or, or the trees were going to have the same capacity to go down and look for the water without having a, a like original tap root from the seedling. But apparently they can do really well as well. Uh, these were just a few other renders that were done by my friend and colleague, Georgi Pavlov on a ranch in Guanajuato as well. He was proposing different systems. In this case, the, the rows in between are mesquite with other fruit trees like a pomegranate and olives, and then vegetable vegetables in between. Beautiful, beautiful systems. Uh, here with other shrubs and medicinal plants and olive trees, mesquite. This is another render that he did with um, uh, grapes, a grapevine with with uh, mesquite rows also following some sort of pattern for water retention and distribution. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, I've been promoting in Mexico the possibility of creating a, a, a national like mesquite institute similar to what is being done with the Mayan the Mayan knot, the Ramon in, in, in Chiapas and in Guatemala, promoting this amazing perennial crop on a, like a more strategic level, working with uh, polit politicians and communities and different other organizations, com uh, 
public doing publication of uh, different handbooks and recipe books and doing trainings and workshops with with women throughout the the region where the Mayan nut grows. There's another institute for the breadfruit, another amazing perennial staple crop from the tropics. So we were thinking, why don't we do something similar for, for the mesquite, um, where we could promote the consumption and large scale integration of mesquite in diversify agricultural systems that improve ecosystem processes and provide economic benefits and food security to farmers in the context of climate change and land degradation, uh, working with different allies in, in promoting these mesquite enterprises and helping raise awareness and um, bring students from universities and theses. He, he actually helped act, bring back the mesquite into the Mexican uh, gastronomy and their nutrition. Um, some of the ideas we had were our lines of work was research and documentation, uh, education and training on everything from the propagation to the planting, the processing, and the, the, the food preparation, recipes, etc. cetera. Um, a library of publications, media, et, and then have this network of demonstration ex and experimental farms like what we're doing with the Via Organica farm another network of community-based processing centers, what I was just mentioning right now with, with these indigenous uh, projects, native, native uh, community projects that we're helping and promoting, a, a network of nurseries and to source plants and seeds, a, maybe do some sort of certification to producers to make sure that they're following like the best practices for food safety and, and, and just like the best practices in general, and then have a school launch and food security programs with the same communities that are producing the, the different mesquite uh, products. No? So this is uh, overall what we're working on in, in, in Mexico. Uh, something that I'm really interested in is how can we, with all the amazing people that are sitting here and all the amazing projects that are happening in, in Arizona, what can we do to actually um, design or implement an, a, an agroforestry system that's actually, that has actually like a commercial vision to it, like a production profitable uh, diversified system that we can create a model or a template for, for, for them to be replicated in other areas or integrated with other agricultural crops that are being grown in the area. Uh, so that's something I'm really interested in. And I'll be very happy to collaborate. Uh, also, I've been really wanting to talk with the, with the team from Desert Harvester to see if we can collaborate on a, it can be a different, but have something similar to the recipe book in Spanish, take some of the amazing recipes that are there already. And um, I am also thinking on like what, what I just talked about in this presentation, how, how can it be um, translated into an actual physical handbook with all like the best practices and, and tables and, and, and recipes, but maybe talk more about the, the, everything from the propagation to the planting the harvesting, the processing, etc. So, the, like a mesquite handbook for farmers and and producers. So, yeah, I'm gonna stop there for now, so that we have time for for questions. Um, here's my email. I already got a great domain, and I'll leave you with the, my favorite uh, mesquite picture that I ever took with a beautiful rainbow and the back from this invasive species in Hawaii. See, see so uh, if I know any uh, ranchers, cattle ranchers or, or that are using mosquitoes fodder, you see, uh, that's actually in many states of Mexico, they, there's a market for mesquite pots that are it's basically just for fodder use. 
uh, for animals. They pay it like super cheaply, like the big uh, bird like sack, maybe for three or four US dollars. Uh, and that's just being used for fodder. Uh, I didn't want to go into it, but we have a whole project with Agave, the Maguey, uh, the Agave Power project sponsored by Be Organica Regeneration International, where we're growing, like in the Be Organica, 30,000. Uh, agave salmiana and agave americana, those big um, maguey species for aguamiel and pulque. And they're being pruned every year, like the old leaves from the base are pruned every year. That's, uh, we have a special meal for, for grinding the, the agave leaves. And then we do silage fermentation of the agave leaves with mesquite powder, the low quality pots that don't go through the selection process and some of the pots that fall into the ground, those are being also grinded and mixed with the agave leaf and then packed very tightly into these uh, five gallon buckets or 55 gallon drums to take all the oxygen, oxygen away. And then we just seal it and we let it ferment for about a month, but it can be left there for up to three years apparently. Uh, and it's just like um, this amazing like probiotic fermented silage, highly digestible uh, and very high in water. So it's great for the dry drought season. So that's something, that it, so you can do it only with the, you can use just the agave leaves, but if you add the mesquite powder, then you um, promote bacteria that help increase even more the protein content on the silage. So that's more uh, another innovation there. But overall, a lot of people just feed the straight pots to their animals. The problem there is that um, the animals cannot process the seed because it's so small and hard. And that's where most of the protein is co um, contained. So that just go goes through the digestive system of the animals and, and that's how they actually spread the mesquite. And of course, many ranchers are um, fighting and spending millions and millions of dollars to eradicate mesquite from their grasslands uh, under this idea that they're competing for water and other resources. While um, it's just so interesting to me. And I can see that when they are being, when mesquite is just like really getting very thick and animals cannot even go through those areas anymore. But most of the time that's just a consequence of bad, um, management of the of the cattle itself no like if they were actually doing like high density non-selective grazing with electric fence uh replicating what the uh herbivores were the big uh, herds of herbivores were doing then it'll be really hard for the mesquite seedlings to actually establish in the first place and since they are not doing that many times they're actually promoting the uh, overgrazing and the certification of their lands and that's prime land for, for prime soil for mesquite to actually grow. So it's a consequence of uh, bad cattle management practices. So I, I think I went a little bit off shoot. Pero si. Yeah, Randy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cattle, uh, sheep, goat, pigs, chickens, even horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're the Via Organica Ranch is doing a whole um, study on 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 weight gain and and uh, reduced cost of uh, buying straw, uh, bales of straw or alfalfa during the drought season. And um, like, for example, alfalfa goes for about five kilograms, five pesos, Mexican pesos per kilogram. And we calculated the cost of the agave silage and it was about two pesos a kilogram. And has much uh, higher, um, the, the animals need much less water as well. 
-hmm. Yeah, super. Yeah, the question is uh, with the air layering cuttings, what's the best time of the year and how long do we uh, leave the, the, the bags on the trees, you not know, like for, 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 the, for the branch to actually root. So uh, the, best, the best season is just when the, just before the trees come out of dormancy. So in San Miguel, that's uh, between January and February, mo mo mostly February. And then they stay, the back stay on the tree for about three months. So that's like March, April, May. And then sometime in May, we cut the branch. It already has this beautiful root system. And that goes into, it can be up to a meter, like three or four feet high and have up to an inch thickness in the, in the branch, the trunk. And then we put that into a, a like a nursery pot for another month so that we get even more um, roots. And then it's perfect timing to transplant those uh, just before the rains or at the beginning of the rainy season. And then we do a heavy pruning just to make sure that they don't have too much uh, leaves for a small amount of roots. Well, we do that when we uh, cut the branch from the tree. Yeah, uh, for example, I mentioned this, oh, that's a question, sorry. She, she was asking that uh, from our experience germinating seedlings from seed, uh, how true, true to type they are to their parent tree or mother tree. He, for example, I was telling Gary that uh, we probably germinated about a thousand or two thousand of the thornless mesquite trees that we found seeds from those trees and i think it was about four or five percent that came spineless so it's a very low percentage now we're going to do our layering cuttings from those um, thornless trees and what will be ideal is that if we could find a small property that's isolated from other mesquites mesquite trees then we could plant a small um, orchard with the air layering cuttings from the spineless trees so that all the genetic that is present in that little field will be the, the spineless ones. And then those seedlings are theories or, or, or ideas that they're gonna have a much higher rate of uh, true type. They're super sweet. I mean, the, the trees that we found, oh, the, yep, in general. Yeah, um, I think I mentioned that at the beginning, but uh, for some reason, these, these species that we have there, the Prosopis labigata, it's very uniform in the taste. You don't get the, the, such a difference from, from one tree to the other, like what you do here in, with Prosopis velutina and glandulosa. Um, so basically any tree that you try a pot from, it's gonna be sweet. And, and that's really, really great. We're very lucky. Uh, we're going, leaving today for Patagonia. I'll be doing the same talk uh, tomorrow afternoon. And then on Thursday, I'm going back to Sonora. But hopefully, hopefully I'll be uh, back soon. There's so many cool things happening here that I would love to be involved and participate. There was one here and then. Uh, he's asking like from those trips to Peru, Hawaii, Argentina, um, what are the best examples of uh, regenerating land in a profitable 
profitable way. You know? uh, most of the actually like mesquite or algarrobo orchards, as they call it in South America, that I visited were more like monocultures, basically, so similar to what I show here. So that wasn't really inspiring for me, I would say. Um, so regarding mesquite itself, there are not many or, or living examples that I can think about right now. Um, there are some cool ranches that I that I work with in in, in Mexico that are doing uh, high density non selective grazing, in a, like through holistic management and and such, that are grazing the animals in uh, this sort of mesquite savanna. No? So the the grazing itself is quite profitable, and the animals get this extra nutrient from the pods that are falling. But in these cases, they are not not actually they are not processing or, or harvesting the mesquite pods themselves. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I show you all these renders that are actually being implemented since last year. It just takes long. I hope I could travel in time a few years. Yeah. Agave Power Initiative. Uh, so this all started a f like about two or three years ago. Uh, I met this professor, uh, Dr. Juan Frias, who was working with these uh, farmers in Guanajuato as well, uh, ranchers who have been using the agave silage for feeding their animals for quite a few years at that time. And I took uh, Ronnie Cummings, the founder, director of Bio Organica and Regeneration International to visit this farm ranch near San Miguel Allende. Uh, and he was really blown away by what the, they were doing and the potential that it had to um, incentivize the planting of agave on a large scale, integrated obviously with, with mesquite, nopal, uh, perennial grasses, etc. Uh, not only for the fodder production and, and economic um, potential of the system, but also for the carbon drawdown potential of um, all these millions of um, hectares of uh, agave mesquite agroforestry system capturing carbon from the atmosphere, uh, regenerating soils and etc. No? So, so that vision, um, the, the, he, he called it the billion agave project, trying to just work with different government agencies and farming communities, campesinos, ejidos, eh, to promote the use of um, agave as a fodder and showing and training, bringing groups to the ranch to train them on the whole processing of the agave silage and also see the actual agroforestry system where it's being implemented. The cool thing about it is that uh, you can do the pruning, make the silage, the fodder, and um, the plant, the agave plant actually benefits from you removing all those old leaves that are sometimes think, taking more energy than what they produce. So the, the piña, the heart of the agave can actually uh, grow quicker than if you don't prune them at all. So at the end of the life cycle of the of these maguey's, which can be eight to 12 or 15 years, uh, you can still harvest the piña for mezcal or agave uh, distillation, and or the more traditional uses of the agave, like the um, aguamiel, the pulque, or the roasting of the piñas for uh, actual food. No? So that that's taking a lot of um, speed. There's a lot of interest from many other countries other than Mexico. Uh, we've been talking with different um, agencies from the federal government as well. They are very interested. E, yeah, uh, this is something we're also promoting with this uh, project with mezcal producers in Oaxaca and the project I was mentioning in, in San Luis Potosí as well in, in Wirikuta. So yeah, um, that's where things are going. And the Via Organica Ranch is just now like completely covered in agave. It's hard hard to find a, a single piece of land where you can put an extra an extra plant right now. It's just, 
very, very incredible. See, I don't have the numbers right now. Um, they are still working on it and they just um, came up with a partnership with um, this organization in the US, Hudson Carbon, Hudson Carbon Project, I think it's called. And they're actually gonna set up a carbon measurement lab at the Via Organica Ranch just to have really precise numbers. But it's uh, like the numbers they come up with just from the literature were really impressive. Um, see, especially in my opinion, if they're integrated with uh, holistic racing uh, systems where you can have perennial grasses that are being managed in a really, in a really uh, holistic way and, and just pumping carbon with, throughout the grass uh, roots into the, into the ground and then have the rows of agave and mesquite interplanted with the with these alleys for grazing so that the ground cover is really dense and 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 doing a lot of photosynthesis yep uh, and no you please and then back there Um, they start, so when do we start pruning the agaves and how much of the agave leaves get pruned every year? Basically, I think what we came up with is that depends obviously on how old is the plant that you're establishing. No? Um, sometimes we, we do uh, plants that are three, four years old, so you can actually start pruning them right away. So that's about the age, three or four years old. Um, but depends on the species and depends on the size of the, of the, of the plant as well. And um, the study that Dr. Juan Frias did was that uh, you can remove up to 20% of the leaves in number every year without affecting the, or, or decreasing the growth rate of the plant. So if it has a, a 20 pencas leaves, then you can harvest four every year. Depends on how many you can count. See, uh, well, that's also not said yet. Uh, we were thinking how, what will be the best way or strategy to establish the system uh, like a, in, like a, like a, so, so we don't plant all the agaves the same year and then have to harvest all of them at the same year. So ideally, um, something about 10 to 20% of the total density gets planted every year. Depends on the species as well, because ideally if it's a plant that takes six years to mature, uh, then you just have to do the numbers so that each year you're putting a, a, a sixth of the total number of agaves so that every year you're gonna be harvest, harvesting all the mature plants um, and not all of them at once, which will be not ideal. Uh, maybe it's different with agave, uh, agave for, for mezcal, depends on the, on the system, because they do like to harvest all of them and restart again which but here if you're using it for aguamiel and pulque or agave syrup then you definitely don't want them to mature at the same time oh yeah sorry Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it varies a lot as well, one year to the other, to the next. Uh, we are in a sort of in a high desert 
plateau, so we're about the same altitude than the area in, in Patagonia. What is that in feet, like 4,000? 4, 4,000 feet. Uh, so we do get like a, the, the pots mature a little later than in other regions of Mexico. So sometimes it can be a little problematic, like this year in particular, um, we did get some rains just about when the pots were maturing. And it just makes the whole logistic much more complicated. Uh, the good thing is as long as they stay in the tree and not fall into the ground, it's a little safer. Uh, what we try to do there is how can we harvest them and dry them as quickly as possible. So that's why this uh, rotating uh, stainless steel toaster that I show is super useful because we can be pretty much harvesting under the rain and be just drying them right away. It's not ideal, you're using a lot of energy as well. So I've been thinking on doing this sort of um, greenhouses where you can have uh, ventilation inside, maybe a dehumidifier. Uh, and that way you can just spread the, the pots on these like mesh tables and start drying them even if it's cloudy or, or rainy, you know? Because uh, I think you guys here, most of the years you can harvest before the rains with no issues or not necessarily changes as well. See, but uh, it's a little more tricky over there. So as long as they don't fall into the ground and you're able to dry them as quickly as possible, um, I think that you're fine. Sometimes we get rains, but this, the, the pots are still green. So that's not a big issue. As long as they are green, they don't usually don't get any mold. The problem is when they are actually like ripe and mature and they get many days of rain or they either fall to the ground where there's humidity and stuff. So that's a very, um, yeah, it's a probably the biggest challenge to, to large scale mesquite production, especially if you wanna have like a, a constant production year to year to, to send to different uh, customers and et cetera. There's, there's another one. Yep, one more. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I don't know about that initiative, but I'll find out more. And this morning I visited the Borderland Restoration Network nursery in Patagonia, Argentina, and I was just blown away of the amazing work they're doing to propagate native trees. And they have a, they have a larger capacity of what they're doing right now. So I will definitely uh, check them out and see if they can be connected to this initiative, but it sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah, um, I'm actually working on that right now, uh, like uh, this morning, <laughs> uh, because I was hired by the uh, German Agency for Sustainable Development, the GIZ, uh, to work on this project in Tehuacan uh, with the agave maguey producers. So they are actually, they hire us to, to, to create a business model for a mesquite enterprise from scratch, like following the best practices, the right equipment, the whole processing, marketing, dis distribution. Uh, so we're working with some people from Terra Genesis International, a really amazing organization here in the US that they're gonna help us uh, do the numbers and have like a really solid um, business model that we can share and, and help other communities apply. So yeah, um, there was my email contact. So we'll, I'll be happy to share that once it's ready. Yeah, thank you. And there were a few questions. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, thank you, Carlos. There were a few questions on the chat, but maybe I can answer them uh, straight there or, or, or they can send me an email. Yeah. See, yeah. see.
por, por favor, please, yes. And, and thank you so much, Gary, for the invitation. What a honor to come here and, and work with you and, and just get to know all these amazing, inspiring projects. I'm very, very grateful. And for the University of the Southwest Center for hosting us as well. Thanks, guys.